Hi, I'm John Yeh, and I play the clarinet. And uh, I was born in Washington, D.C., but when I was two years old, I moved to Los Angeles with my parents, who are both scientists but music lovers. They exposed me to music in the house from an early age. My dad had uh, hi-fi, and he played records and listened to the um, good music radio, the classical music station in Los Angeles. And uh, when I was five, they gave... Um, me piano lessons and they said okay you're gonna take piano lessons and we had this great Steinway upright piano and I started taking piano lessons but I don't think I got along well with the teacher and that's always key you have to have a teacher that uh, is sympathetic and gets along well so I didn't really like practicing but um, I took lessons for a year and then when I was in school in second grade they actually offered orchestra instruments so somehow the clarinet picked me. And so that was the beginning of my clarinet uh, career at the age of six. And my parents were very supportive. They said, you know, okay, we'll get you lessons. So they signed me up for lessons at the local music store. And I had a very patient teacher and an excellent teacher. And so I learned, and then they signed me up for uh, playing in youth orchestras and um, took me to concerts at the Los Angeles Philharmonic. I still remember one of the earliest concerts that they did in the uh, Dorothy Chandler Pavilion at the uh, Music Center in Los Angeles. And that was a very um, uh, definitely uh, influential experience for me. So I enjoyed going to orchestras, enjoyed playing in orchestras, meeting other uh, young musicians that also played instruments like a certain young Wes Kenny. And he and I went to junior high school together and junior high school music camp. And also all through uh, high school, we were in, in the same class. He was a trombone player. And at the time when we were in uh, junior high school camp at Idlewild, we, play, we actually stayed in the same cabin together. <laughs> this was in 1969 at the Idlewild uh, Music Camp. And boy, uh, we were just reminiscing about some of the fun times we had and some of the crazy and kooky times we had and some of the great experiences that we had with the uh, um, conductors there and the uh, coaches there and people that uh, you know we still look upon for inspiration. But uh, Wes and I sort of lost touch. I actually didn't really know where he had gone. I knew he was a football player in, in high school. And when I was in the um, marching band, he was always on the field playing football. He was a star football player at University High School in Los Angeles. But um, neither the football team nor the uh, marching band were particularly uh, star-studded organizations. We, we just did it for the fun of it. And um, so I always thought, you know, Wes is a real good athlete, but I thought his musical uh, activities sort of fallen by the wayside. And I didn't really realize that he'd followed a musical career until very recently when we kind of reconnected on Facebook, which is ubiquitous now. And so I found out that uh, Choi, who is uh, soloing with me tonight and with Wes in the Fort Collins Symphony, um, mentioned that uh, oh, I met Choi in Montana a couple of years ago when we were in, he plays in the, or at that time he played in the Great Falls Symphony Orchestra in Montana and I was doing solos with the Great Falls Symphony and Choi was sort of my host. And then he said, you know, I also play in the Fort Collins Symphony. I said, oh, where's that? He says in Colorado and it's an 11 hour drive. And I say, wow, that's quite a commute. I said, who's the uh, music director in Fort Collins? And he said, Wes Kenny. And I just like my hair stood up and I said, really? Because I had known that he was a conductor, but I hadn't put two and two together that he was in Fort Collins. So that began the process of reconnecting with Wes and then coming here to Fort Collins. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here, Had, having a wonderful time in this town with this great orchestra and their um, stellar music director and Choi and the rest of his colleagues in the orchestra. Both my parents are, are music lovers, and my dad and my mom both studied music when they were very young and through college. In fact, my dad was a, a, a choral conductor and in, in college in China. And then when he came to the United States, he went to Harvard for his doctorate, and he uh, studied uh, mechanical engineering at Harvard. But he also 
uh, participated in the Harvard Glee Club, which regularly sang concerts with the Boston Symphony. So he was in concerts with the Boston Symphony, in Symphony Hall, singing with Charles Munch and with uh, other great conductors that uh, would perform with the Boston Symphony. So he had that background. And my mom had taken piano lessons when she was very young in China. Both of my parents emigrated from China in the uh, mid-1950s actually the mid the late 1940s and they met in uh, in uh, Washington DC and uh, so that's where I was born and um, so I guess I'm the first generation Chinese American born so and also I uh, the first Asian musician to join the Chicago Symphony fast forward a couple of decades and uh, in 1977 I joined the Chicago Symphony and um, before that, they never had an Asian musician. Now we have many. We have about 18 Asian musicians, most of whom are Chinese. So um, that's an interesting subject. And then, um, so I uh, studied pre-med because my, my uh, parents were both scientists. My dad, an engineer, a structural engineer, a mechanical engineer, and my mom, a biochemist. And so they both encouraged me to, to go into the sciences, and, and I was interested in the sciences. And I went to um, high school and studied all the uh, calculus and biology and physics and uh, chemistry and, and took all the AP exams and everything like that. And when I entered UCLA uh, at the age of 15, I was a pre-med major. But I also liked music so much that I signed up for the uh, uh, orchestras there and uh, for the American Youth Symphony, which was a huge um, influence on me uh, early on because we uh, studied under Meili Mehta, who was the conductor, and uh, Wes's uh, wife Leslie and I have been talking about Meili because she had uh, experience playing under Meili in the early days as well. And we're all from LA. She, as well as Wes and I, all grew up in LA. So we've been kind of reconnecting and figuring out who we know in common and which experiences that we had as youth. And the American Youth Symphony rehearsed at UCLA, and we uh, played all the big repertoire, all the Strauss tone poems, the Beethoven, Brahms, Tchaikovsky, Ravel, all the big works. So I had learned everything about orchestra playing from Meli Mehta, and he really was one of my big mentors. And that really helped me when I decided at uh, after two years of pre-med at uh, UCLA to transfer to music school. One of the other reasons was because I attended the Aspen Festival, and Aspen was uh, an amazing uh, gathering point for world-class classical musicians. And so there I met Itzhak Perlman and Pinka Zuckerman and uh, James Levine and the Juilliard String Quartet and the Cleveland String Quartet, all these amazing world-class musicians. And I said, that's what I want to do. And that was really the, the turning point. And I said, <laughs> I, I tell people uh, now that the best thing at that point, the best thing my parents ever did for me, the best uh, gift my parents ever did were, was uh, support me when I decided to make the career change halfway through college. I remember sitting at the dinner table and uh, I lived at home because I went to UCLA which was less than a mile from my parents house so at the dinner table I said to them one day I said you know I'm thinking of uh, transferring to music school because I met a lot of people from Juilliard and Indiana University and Eastman while I was at uh, Aspen and um, I sort of got a taste of what the professional music world is like and I think I'd like to give it a shot. And uh, of course both of them being scientists but music lovers they kind of looked at each other and they said well you know it's a very competitive field and um, but we want you to be happy so uh, do your best and we'll support you. So that's the best gift my parents ever gave to me. I say that uh, now, but in actuality, the best gift my parents ever gave me was their genes because my dad's 92 and my mom's 86. And my mom just retired from full-time work at the Veterans Administration Hospital um, at the age of 86. And so, I'm just uh, happy that they're both around and I can visit them in LA and uh, 
that they supported me when I decided to make music a, a career. So then I entered the Juilliard School um, when I was 17 and fully thinking that I would be there for four years and, and get a degree. But in my second year, I auditioned for the Chicago Symphony and was selected to be a musician in the Chicago Symphony on bass clarinet and clarinet. So well, when I told my parents that, they said, are you sure you're going to take that? And I said, hey, this opportunity happens maybe if you're lucky once in a lifetime. So I said, I'm going to take it. And then after I started at uh, the Chicago Symphony, I decided I have some free time. I'm going to enroll in college at the Northwestern University Music School. And so I took counterpoint, I took harmony, I took modern music, I took clarinet lessons with uh, the great professor Robert Marcellus, and then Juilliard was happy to grant me the uh, Bachelor of Music degree. I joined the Chicago Symphony in uh, June of 1977. I auditioned in May, right before my 20th birthday. And so I um, started, it's been almost 40 years now. Next year will be my 40th season in the Chicago Symphony. And it's, I've seen a lot happen. I've seen a lot of changes there. The orchestra is almost completely different than uh, it was when I first joined. But a few musicians are still there from when I first joined. But I guess I'm one of the older ones now. And uh, it's been a, an amazing career. It's been an amazing ride. And we've had so many great musical experiences, great music directors like Schulte, Sir George Schulte, who hired me, and then Daniel Barenboim, and then now our uh, great music director, uh, Ricardo Muti. And so I'm very happy and I'm very uh, pleased that I also have the flexibility in my schedule to be able to do some solo appearances like here with the Fort Collins Symphony and doing some recitals and next couple of weeks I'm doing a recital at the Interlochen Arts Academy which is a well-known place and I'm going to premiere a, a new sonata by Jim Stevenson which I'm working on right now which is a difficult piece and then uh, so I have the opportunities to play chamber music I have a group called the Chicago Pro Musica that I founded in uh, when I first joined the orchestra back my third year in 1980 and um, we actually won the Grammy Award in 1985 for best new classical artist because we made some landmark recordings now they're considered of the Stravinsky Soldier's Tale and Walton's Facade and uh, we were honored with the Grammy Award for best new classical artist. It's, it was quite an uh, quite a lucky uh, happening and we still continue to this day with Chicago Pro Musica and we've done tours we've gone to uh, Europe and Japan and played in Australia and so we, we still do even with our very uh, packed tight Chicago Symphony schedule we still manage to do a few Chicago Pro Musica concerts. My, uh, my wife Teresa Riley is also a clarinet player and um, she and I formed an ensemble called Birds in Phoenix and this is with two traditional Chinese string players and this was a few years ago we had a whole uh, program of music that was written for us and um, other music like Bach and Mozart and uh, uh, Bach and Mozart basically that were transcribed for our quartet so that was a fun thing and then my daughter Molly Ye who's a percussionist she went to Juilliard so and she graduated from Juilliard in 2011 and so very proud of her but when she was still in high school she and Teresa and I went down to uh, Columbus State University in Georgia and uh, stayed with the Columbus State Wind Ensemble for a week and made a recording with them that's out now on the Noxos label it's called Synergy and we have a couple of double concertos couple of concertos that I played with the band myself and uh, we put that all together in in one week in, and I'm very proud of uh, that accomplishment. First of all you have to listen you have to hear all different sorts of music all different sorts of musicians and I'm very fortunate to be surrounded by a group of amazing colleagues and so I hear what they do and it sets the standard very high 
And it's great to be able to travel and see colleagues all over the world, like Wes Kenny, who's um, studying a very high level with the Fort Collins Symphony. And to be able to collaborate with these folks is a great joy for me. But um, in order to maintain a very high standard, you have to constantly hone your craft. And when you're a clarinet player, for example, you have to get good reads and then make sure the sound is good. And then just just really, um, I would say each week my repertoire varies because I play a different concert with the Chicago Symphony every week. And in the Chicago Symphony, we have um, some pieces that we play all the time, uh, regular repertoire, and then other pieces that we rarely play, and then other pieces that are completely new. So when it's a new piece, it requires real delving into a, a score and really studying the score and its context and making sure, even if it's a piece that you know, to make sure that the context is always ingrained in your uh, mind's ear. So the ear and the mind are very powerful uh, systems in the musician. And so if you hear something in your mind's ear in the way you want it to go, you're much more likely to be able to produce it when you play on an instrument or when you sing in a voice. And I always uh, consider that the, uh, the clarinet to be a vocal instrument and always think of it as such. So whenever I play something, I always have in mind the way it would be if I were singing the line or singing the piece and then also having in mind the whole orchestra surrounding me. So whenever I go to any situation, even if it's my own practice room, I always have the virtual orchestra with me. And I think that's a very, very good piece of advice for anybody that's studying music to be able to know the context. And we were just giving a master class the other day at uh, uh, Colorado State University here in town just yesterday in fact and um, it was clear that the players that played um, were uh, helped and were um, benefited by knowing not only the instrumental context but also the historical and the textural context of the music that uh, that they played so I always like to give the uh, environment and the context very, very important emphasis in learning music. I have uh, a part-time teaching clarinet. Uh, I'm a clarinet, they call it artist faculty at the Chicago College of Performing Arts, which is part of the Roosevelt University in Chicago. And um, I'm happy to be on that faculty because we have a very fine orchestral training program. And we have quite a diverse in international uh, student body. We have had uh, musicians come from China and Japan and from Spain and uh, uh, the Scandinavian countries, as well as uh, from all parts of the United States. So uh, that's, that's what a lot of my time that's off of orchestra is spent on, is teaching students. And uh, occasionally I'll have students come from uh, other orchestras that want to get some you know, feedback on things that they do for auditions and things like that. So I'll teach on an occasional basis uh, a private lesson that's, that's not one of my university students. And I also am uh, very uh, interested because you know I had such a great experience at the uh, American Youth Symphony with Meili Mehta. I hold that in high regard to nurture very young musicians and so I'm on the board and also on the faculty of Midwest Young Artists in uh, suburban Chicago. It's up in Fort Sheridan in Chicago. And um, it was founded by a, a very good friend of mine, Alan Dennis. Dr. Dennis is, is really quite an educational genius. And he has formed this uh, center, M Midwest Young Artists, to nurture orchestra players, chamber music. They have jazz. They have... Uh, choruses. They uh, have many, many musicians of pre-college age. And so uh, when i am got some time, I like to participate in that, uh, in that venture as well. I love listening to jazz. Jazz is something that speaks to me. And although I haven't really um, acquired the or spent the time to, to uh, nurture the, uh, it's, a, it's a discipline. I would say the discipline of 
of playing jazz. Um, I, I have an album called Ebony Concerto, and that's got some jazz-influenced music on it that was written for Benny Goodman and Artie Shaw, who actually, Artie and I share the same birthday, May 23rd. And, uh, and I, I was privileged to have lunch with him once uh, back, oh, it was about 20 years ago or so, after he had long quit playing the clarinet and uh, had a very interesting uh, chat with him. And uh, it's just, I think, uh, all those experiences have gone into creating what my voice is now. So I like listening to jazz. I don't say that I'm, uh, I could ever really play it, but it's, um, it's been an influence in my, uh, in my makeup. There are all different sorts of instruments, and uh, in, in the wind instrument category, we're relatively fortunate because you don't have to pay, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars for an instrument, even millions of dollars now for certain stringed instruments. But a clarinet basically is still factory made, and you can get one for a couple of thousand dollars, a really good one. And so my first clarinet was actually made out of metal. It was a one-piece metal B-flat clarinet, and I rented it from school. And then my parents said, maybe we should get you an instrument that you can uh, you know, call your own and be proud of. And so uh, my, help, my teacher helped me pick out an instrument, and that was a student model, but it was made out of wood, so I had to figure out how to put it together and be careful with it and make sure it didn't get bent or broken or knocked around or anything like that. And then a couple of years later, um, my parents said, okay, you should uh, get a professional quality instrument. So when I was 12, and by the time I was 12, uh, every day my parents had to remind me to practice. They said, have you practiced yet? And I said, no. Okay, go practice for 15 minutes before breakfast. So I'd do that and I'd sort of get in the habit, but my parents had to tell me. And then by the time I turned 12, something made me want to practice on my own. So then my parents said, it's probably time for you get, to get a new instrument. And so uh, at that time, the best clarinet, you couldn't pay more than $300 for. <laughs> but that was a long time ago. Now it's 10 times that. But uh, so they bought me a new instrument and I um, played that through college. And now, um, since I've been in the Chicago Symphony, I've had many different sets of instruments, and the clarinet, you may know, is a family of instruments. So the standard B-flat clarinet is what we usually play, but then there's the A clarinet, which is used for some chamber music and some orchestra, and then there's the bass clarinet, which is the um, double the size of a regular clarinet, and it curves around. And that's the first uh, clarinet that I auditioned for in the Chicago Symphony. I was a bass clarinet specialist when I joined. And then several years later, I got knocked up a couple of uh, octaves and, and the piccolo clarinet is now my specialty. So it's the E flat clarinet and it's this little clarinet and very notoriously difficult to play. But that happens to be my specialty in the Chicago Symphony these days. And then um, there's the contrabass clarinet, which I've also played in the, uh, in the orchestra. And I've actually made recordings on the contrabass clarinet, the bass clarinet, the E flat clarinet, the B flat, the A clarinet. Uh, we have D clarinets, which is also a um, piccolo clarinet. So as you see, it's a whole family of instruments. And the basset horn is, is an instrument that's called the basset horn, but it's actually a, an alto clarinet in F. And so it's a, it's a big family of instruments and, and I um, get familiar with each one of them as the repertoire uh, demands. There was one time that I actually did have to perform on a saxophone and that was in this opera written by Eugene Zador, a uh, Hungarian composer. It happened to have probably just an eight bar solo for the saxophone. So I borrowed a saxophone from a friend of mine and I actually did perform on it. But I would um, probably never consider myself good enough to perform on a saxophone. Flute is even more different. Uh, possibly could get some, some notes out of it. But, uh, and then the, there's the double reeds. And there are some players, some very fine m musicians that um, make a living from being a doubler, which means they play all different kinds of wind instruments usually. And so, um, and in the old days, I think a common double would have been 
to play the stand-up uh, double bass and the tuba because they're both bass instruments. And nowadays you find um, some very, very talented show musicians that carry with them flutes, piccolos, clarinets, saxophones of all different sizes and shapes. And uh, oboes and bassoons, they, they can play all of these instruments. Well, I've um, just kind of concentrated on the clarinet family, which for me is enough of a challenge. But some people are special specialists within the clarinet family, so they only play the regular B-flat clarinet. But I've um, tried to be versatile within the clarinet family, and that, that versatility comes in handy. In my early days, this, this was probably my fourth or fifth season in the Chicago Symphony in the early 1980s. We, uh, we'd go to New York City um, practically every year, sometimes twice a year. So this was a, a trip to New York City on the stage of Carnegie Hall with uh, Maestro uh, Scholte conducting Mahler's Second Symphony. And this is a huge work with a gigantic orchestra of more than 110 players and a big chorus behind us and uh, five clarinets. And so my colleague, um, Jim Moffat, who's a very good friend of mine who plays in the Honolulu Symphony, and I were playing the two E-flat clarinet parts, the piccolo clarinet. And um, so we're warming up on stage before the concert starts, and I decide, as Maestro Schulte is walking out on stage, to clean my clarinet with my swab. So I quickly um, grab my swab and run it through the clarinet and pull, and it gets stuck. And I said, oh my gosh. But at this point, you know, it's just like, okay, I'll just pull harder and try to get it, but that was the wrong thing to do because once you pull harder, it gets firmly lodged in there. And then, now I'm beginning to be a little bit uh, nervous. And so, they uh, tuned the orchestra already, trying to kind of pull it out and be um, inconspicuous, but the entire chorus is on stage and it's kind of looking at me. <laughs> and Maestro Schulte still hasn't, uh, notice that anything's amiss in the clarinet section. But pretty soon, most of my uh, colleagues in the uh, wind section were aware that something was going on in the clarinet section. So the piece starts, and I'm thinking, oh, I still have maybe a minute before I have to play. And <laughs> my, um, my colleague Jim Moffat is sitting there with his E-flat clarinet kind of like shaking for, for out of nervousness for me. And then people are sending me back different uh, equipment, like here's a screwdriver and here's a piece of cigarette paper because they think I've got something, you know, a bubble in my hole, uh, one of my finger holes or something. And none of these things is helpful. So I said, Jim, you know, the first entrance is coming up. Maybe I should borrow your instrument. So he says, sure, here, take this. <laughs> so I take my mouthpiece off. He takes his mouthpiece off, gives me his instrument and my mouthpiece doesn't fit on his instrument. It's too big, and he says, here, take my mouthpiece. So I put his mouthpiece on, and I play the whole first entrance on his E-flat clarinet using his reed and his mouthpiece. And then I end up doing the entire first movement of, the, of Mahler's Second Symphony on his equipment while he's trying to um, fish out my uh, swab. Finally, after the first movement, everybody is kind of like, what's going on there? And luckily there's a pause. So finally one of the flute players gives me a flute cleaning rod and as I put, push the uh, swab out from the other end. So that was uh, probably my most embarrassing moment on the stage uh, ever. It's basically a, a piece of cloth. It's like a handkerchief with a, a string attached to it or ribbon attached to it and there's a weight at the end of the ribbon. So the clarinet is a tube. I should have brought my clarinet here, I could show you. It's a tube. You put the weight through and the, the ribbon goes to the other end and you can grab it on the other end, pull it through, and this, the handkerchief is supposed to pull through the bore of the instrument and wipe out any moisture that's collected as you're playing. Well, what happens is if it's balled up at the um, top, you start pulling it through, it'll get stuck in the middle. And that's why haste makes waste. And don't ever clean out a clarinet uh, hastily without making sure the entire handkerchief is extended because it might get stuck. 
And if it's on the stage of Carnegie Hall, it might be very embarrassing. <laughs>